for the uh, for the past five or six years, the senior residents at the McKady Family Medicine Residency Program have uh, have presented a poster session out in the exhibit hall here at the annual Ogden Surgical Medical Society meetings. And this year, we chose to kind of bring them in from the cold and and uh, allow them to give a. Uh, a short formal presentation on a collage of, of, of I think you'll find very current and re relevant topics. Um, each resident is going to introduce themselves and give you a, an idea of where they're going to be going after graduation here next month. Also, uh, due to the time constraints, we ask that you uh, save your questions. They'll be available after Dr. Kopecki's talk up here at the front if you have any questions to ask them. So we'll start off with our, our first re of six residents talks. Thanks. My name is Stan Graham, and um, I will be practicing for the next two years in Kalula, Australia, which is just uh, on the eastern coast near um, uh, Fraser Island. Um, I uh, recently had an opportunity um, in January to go to Paraguay for an away rotation uh, as part of my residency experience. And while I was there, I had um, uh, a, a great opportunity to um, spend a little bit of time at a leper colony, a, a hospital uh, where they treated leprosy, and that sparked the interest in this topic um, that I'm going to present today. Um, leprosy, also known as Hansen's disease here in the United States, um, is a mycobacteria and uh, similar uh, to uh, tuberculosis in nature. Um, it's an acid fast bacillus, um, obligate intracellular parasite, and it has its optimal growth at about um, 27 to 33 degrees Celsius, giving it its uh, predilection for the face, uh, the extremities, and um, nervous tissue. Um, it's slow growing. The generation time is about 12.5 days. Um, it's never been cultured in artificial medium, uh, but they can culture it in uh, mouse foot pads, and they do do some sensitivity testing um, with uh, mouse foot pads to see what uh, antibiotics it's um, sensitive to. Um, it's been found in uh, animals, um, the armadillo, uh, chimpanzees, uh, Sudi mangabe monkeys, and macaque monkeys. Um, the, the leprosy is thought to spread through the respiratory route, um, similar to tuberculosis. Um, uh, it's also, uh, according to the um, United States Department of Health and Human Services, um, there are about 95% of uh, the human population which is not susceptible to uh, uh, Hans's disease. Um, uh, the risk factors for it include age, there's a bimodal distribution, and um, the type of leprosy. And it's thought that multibacillary leprosy is more contagious uh, than the posse bacillary uh, leprosy. Um, and I'll go through those definitions in a little bit. Um, it's also uh, more commonly uh, found in people with impaired cell-mediated immunity, and I thought that um, because of that, as we get, as we use more biologics here in the United States, and as um, as we've recently found with the uh, um, uh, swine flu, the the rap rapidity with which things travel from country to country, um, I, I would expect that the the incidence of this may uh, uh, increase a little bit. Um, the diagnosis is principally the, uh, on physical exam. You find uh, skin lesions, which can be hypopigmented or hyperpigmented lesions, um, uh, which are, are devoid of sensation. Um, uh, you can have a swelling of the nerves of the peripheral nerves, such as the ulnar, median, superficial radial, uh, greater auricular, or common perineal nerves. Um, you can uh, diagnose it on skin smears and biopsies. Uh, these are, need to be taken from the center of the lesion, the anesthetic portion of the lesion. And um, there are also some laboratory tests, including the antiphenolic glycolipid 1 antibody and some polymerase chain reaction um, uh, uh, assays to test for it. As mentioned before, the sensitivity testing has historically been done in the mouse foot pad. Um, uh, but is increasingly being done by PCR, although that's, uh, the sensitivity testing isn't available in a lot of these um, countries where uh, it's endemic. Um, so here are some of the uh, pictures of the, some of the clinical features. That, um, uh, these show some typical lesions, hypopigmented lesions. Um, uh, there on the right you have a, 
the enlargement of that uh, greater auricular nerve. Um, uh, you get sensory nerve loss. Uh, it can be tested in the, uh, particularly in the peripheries with the um, a monofilament testing or um, a pin prick. And then you can get some motor nerve loss. This uh, shows uh, foot drop. You can also get claw hand and, and other um, typical features of uh, motor nerve loss in the extremities. Um, so the, the main uh, classification system that's used um, uh, these days is the uh, World Health Authority. World Health Organization classification, and it has two class, well, three classifications, um, two main ones, the posse basilary, which uh, includes five or fewer skin lesions, um, and uh, does not have detectable bacilli on skin smears, and then there's the multi basilary, which is six or more, and then if a person just has a single lesion, then that's considered a single lesion posse basilary, and um, there's a slightly different treatment for that, and I'll get to that in a minute. Epidemiology, uh, there were um, about 250,000 um, new cases detected worldwide during 2007, which was the latest information that I could find. Um, this was uh, done by the, the World Health Organization, and this is down from a peak back in 2001 uh, where there were 760,000 um, new cases. In the United States in 2006, uh, there were 137 new cases. 85% of those cases were from immigrants, people coming into the United States. And uh, in Utah, there were five cases uh, in the 10-year period from 1996 to 2006. And two of those were um, actually found in 2006. There's also a, a higher incidence in, in males than in females. Um, there are several countries where this is endemic. The two main ones um, uh, that the literature mentions are Brazil and India. Um, and they still have uh, fairly large populations of uh, uh, people with leprosy. Uh, this is a, a graph of the incidence in the United States, and as you can see, it's been decreasing um, down to about 2001, and then uh, has increased slightly since then. This is a graphic of uh, the states where you find the most cases. Um, on the top is the 2006 data, and um, uh, on the bottom, the 10 years before that, and I just thought this was interesting. As you as you might expect, um, uh, the states where we have people coming into the countries tend to have higher um, uh, numbers of, of cases. And this is the the demographic information. Um, the highest incidence is in the Asian and uh, Pacific uh, Islanders, and after that is the white Hispanics, and then after that the Caucasian or white population. So uh, what's the treatment for this? Um, the, the WHO uh, recommends for a posse bacillary adult uh, that they have six months of rifampin, 600 milligrams, once a month, and dapsone, 100 milligrams um, daily. Um, for a single lesion um, posse bacillary, um, you can use rifampin, oxifloxacin, and ofloxacin, rather, and minocycline, um, a, a single dose. And then um, for the multi they recommend 12 months of treatment with rifampin, clofazamine, um, a, a, with an initial dose and then a, a, a lower dose uh, throughout the month. Um, these are just uh, pictures of the blister packs that they make. Uh, in developing countries, they'll just hand six of those uh, for the six-month treatment on the top or 12 of the bottom ones to the patients when they come in and are diagnosed so they have a full course of treatment and and um, they also have different dosing for the, the children, um, slightly different. Uh, other treatments that have been done here in the United States that uh, differ from the, the WHO uh, treatment um, are the, uh, they've found that fluoroquinolones can be effective. Um, uh, the two that are used most often are ofloxacin and levofloxacin, and it's been uh, demonstrated that levofloxacin probably has the, the best um, uh, uh, chance of eliminating um, uh, leprosy. Uh, macrolides, particularly clarithromycin, and then uh, minocycline uh, for the tetracyclines. And um, of, of those treatments, uh, clarithromycin was uh, the worst um, out of the three. Um, so also in, in leprosy, uh, after the, the tre uh, treatment has been done and the, the um, bacterium has been um, treated, uh, during the treatment or after, the, the patients can have um, secondary effects. 
And there are type 1 reactions, which is uh, erythema and, and edema of the pre-existing skin lesions. Um, and that's often accompanied by neuritis or ulceration. And that's treated with prednisone. Uh, you can also have a type 2 reaction, which is erythema nodosum, leprosum, um, uh, which is similar to the erythema nodosum that you can find um, uh, 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 on other occasions, um, but it can happen all over the body. And um, the treatment for that also is prednisone, uh, or, and if that's not effective, then they, they'll add clo clofazamine or thalidomide. <clears throat> this is a patient that I saw uh, on my trip who had um, the um, erythema nodosum uh, leprosum on his arms um, and was being uh, started on, again on uh, prednisone therapy for that. Um, he had been treated back in 2004, so even um, really up to about, they say about five years um, after the initial treatment for leprosy, they can be, still be having these uh, side effects. Um, and this is an elderly patient that had been treated 18 years ago, and, and I thought this was interesting because he had, he had not been treated uh, soon enough with the uh, treatment for leprosy and um, had some nerve atrophy and also some uh, uh, damage, uh, permanent damage to the nerves, and so he ended up with uh, what looked very much to me like a diabetic foot where he had gotten osteomyelitis on multiple occasions and had to have the bone scraped and um, they uh, at this hospital where I um, was they had a, a center where they would make orthotics for the patients that had, had uh, uh, tissue damage and, or nerve damage and, and all that and uh, that concludes my talk. My name is Zach Bailey. I'm from, originally from Price, Utah. I'm heading to uh, kind of rural eastern Oregon, a small town called uh, John Day, to start my practice in August. And that's kind of what's led me to choose this topic. I'm going to be the only physician in the church I attend there, and I, I'm a little bit worried about the number of questions I'm going to have to answer. Um, so to start out, I thought I would give my disclosures. I, I do have a family. I have a few friends, and I may have fewer after I implement the guidelines I'm about to show you. And in a, in a health care system that, that largely caters to the rich and neglects and overcharges the uninsured, I don't like to be thought of as a, a wealthy doctor unwilling to help the, the uninsured. So the AMA Code of Ethics states that the physician's feelings when treating a friend or a family member may unduly influence his or her professional judgment, thereby interfering with the care being delivered. The American College of Physicians Ethics Manual strongly, strongly discourages but does not prohibit physicians from treating family members, limiting such situations to those of necessity and cautioning that the patient be transferred to the care of another physician as soon as possible. <clears throat> from a legal standpoint, uh, the scope of, of federal law is really only written in terms of our ability to prescribe controlled substances. And in, in that specific instance, they do require that the prescriber have a bona fide patient-physician relationship and include a written record of that relationship. Lastly, the, the malpractice issue I think is, is somewhat interesting. Are we covered when we treat friends and family members? Um, I put this question to Kathy Adams, the risk manager, and um, with help of my advisor, that question got forwarded to the IHC attorney. And the, the following scenario was kind of painted for her. You are confronted by someone in church who's had a two-week history of an upper respiratory infection that's grown progressively worse. They now have fevers. You prescribe an antibiotic in an attempt to help. The patient has an allergy to that antibiotic and, and an anaphylactic reaction and dies. You are then sued by their family. And at least per the IHC attorney, you're not covered. So um, you may want to shut down that weekend lemonade stand in the garage clinic or else buy some supplemental insurance. I'm really not, not qualified, and, and at least when I heard this scenario, I thought, well, what about this scenario? And I'm not qualified to answer whether or not you're covered, but I think it is worthwhile checking or at least defining for yourselves where your malpractice insurance will kick in and, and where it doesn't. So with, with that background in mind, um, I decided to go to the people I've, I've come to love and admire in residency and ask exactly what they were doing. 
And Tyler Dixon kind of started this ball rolling. He did a poster last year on treating friends and family, and he uh, had a survey sitting at his desk, and he got six responses to that survey of, from you, some from of you, <clears throat> on whether or not you're treating friends and family and some of the controversy associated with that. I took the survey and handed it out at the last uh, April Weber County Medical Society meeting, and I got a total of, of 33 responses with uh, Tyler six. And, and these are the questions that I asked. I'm just going to go through the results with you so you know, you know at least what some of your colleagues are doing. So the first question was just trying to get at how many of us are actually treating friends and family. <clears throat> and when asked, have you ever made a diagnosis, prescribed medications, or examined a patient outside the clinic setting, that patient being a family member or friend, unanimously you said yes. 100% of responders had done that before. The next question, trying to get at how often are we doing this, um, I asked the question in the past month, how many times have you treated a family member or a friend? And it was a multiple choice sort of day. Um, so a 40%, or excuse me, 15% of responders said they hadn't in the last month. Overwhelmingly, uh, one to four times they had treated. 6% uh, said five to nine patients per month and 12% uh, had treated 10 or more. Um, and then trying to get at the reason that we're doing this, I asked what was the main reason you felt it necessary to treat a family member or a friend? And you can see we were kind of spread out there. The majority of people felt it was more convenient. Uh, others felt it was expected of them. Some people uh, felt it was more cost effective. and. Um, some of the other reasons listed included that uh, they felt they could give the best treatment to that friend or family member, which I think is, is definitely true when we think about those illnesses that are not easily diagnosed. Oftentimes, the family member is the one that's, that's willing to look the most into the symptoms and try to come up with a diagnosis. Other, other responses included uh, donations for Boy Scout physicals. When looking at uh, what prescriptions were given, I asked, what do you find are the most common medications you prescribe? And overwhelmingly, the answer came back as antibiotics. Uh, no one at least admitted to prescribing most narcotics or antihistamines. The others included uh, azomine inhalers, hypertensive medications, thyroid medications, antihistamines, and anti-inflammatories. <clears throat> when asked how... Um, when asked which of the following best describes your feeling about these encounters, Overwhelmingly, uh, people responded that I am, provided a, providing a, I am providing a service to them that gratifies me. Um, some people felt that people abused the privilege. Other people felt that, that it came with the job. And among the others, uh, some people said that they like to save their office time for patients that paid money. Um, Um, when asked how do patients feel about these encounters, or at least the provider's perception of how the patient feels, uh, the response was overwhelmingly that the patient was grateful for the service that was rendered. Nobody responded that the patient felt upset that we didn't do more. Um, there were some responses that the patients felt like they were entitled to the care they had received from you. And only, uh, well, there were a few other responses as well. <clears throat> So the next question is really to get at what are the inadequacies of, of this type of treatment. <clears throat> um, and, and most physicians felt that the, an abbreviated exam far and above was the, the inadequacy of the counter. Other people cited poor history, no exam tools, uh, diagnoses based on assumptions, as well as uh, poor follow-up. And then uh, kind of getting back to the malpractice issue, you know, whether or not you're covered when you're treating friendly, friends or family, I guess, is dependent upon your insurance, at least with IHC in the scenario I've given, we, we know we're not. But how many of us are documenting these encounters? And overwhelmingly, 84% uh, of people said no, they do not document. When asked if uh, the physician was aware of the ethical or legal guidelines in this area of medicine, it was pretty much split half and half. But when asked whether or not they considered it, considered it ethical to prescribe for family, friends and family members, um, overwhelmingly the response was yes. 
So that was the result of my survey. This is actually a study that was done in 2002 that was cited in the AMA journal, looking at residents that prescribe for non-patients. And I think that the results we see here mirror uh, our own county, or at least the respondents to my survey. 100% of doctors admit to prescribing for friends or family members. Uh, 80, or excuse me, admit to doing it. 83% have prescribed medication for a family member. 80% have diagnosed a medical illness. 15% had acted as a family member's primary attending physician in the hospital. 72% had performed physical examinations. 9% had operated on a family member. And these, these last two statistics, I guess, are the ones I found the most interesting. 33% of people reported that they had observed another physician inappropriately involved in a family member's care. So I feel like we all kind of draw our own line in the sand as to what we feel comfortable doing for friends and family. But it's a little bit, you know, on the surface, it seems almost hypocritical that 33% of us say, well, your line wasn't drawn appropriately, but my line's okay. Um, and, and I realize there's a broad spectrum as to what people are willing to do, and I don't doubt that sometimes people overstep, uh, overstep bounds. 22% uh, had acceded to a specific request about which they felt uncomfortable. And I actually thought that percentage was probably a little bit low. I feel like most of the physicians I talked to about the issue at some point had been hit up for narcotics at church or had, had at one point in time been asked a question that they were unfeel, uncomfortable asking, answering in the, in the situation that it presented itself. Um, so, you know, where do I draw my line in the sand uh, or where will I draw my land, line as I, as I move to Oregon? This was actually uh, more of an editorial than anything else that came out in the American College of Physicians. <clears throat> and these are, this is the recommendations that, that they gave. In terms of treating friends and family members, you need to help them obtain appropriate care and assume the role of a loving advisor rather than a provider. Treat only minor problems or emergencies when necessary if within your area of expertise. Transfer to another physician as soon as possible. Document the encounter and communicate with patients PCP and uh, never give narcotics. That's actually against the law, which in some ways is comforting that we can definitely uh, use that as an excuse as we're approached for pain medications by patients. Um, that's the pair of turkeys I shot in Washington last weekend. <laughs> Thank you for your time. My name is Trevor Satterfield, uh, and I am uh, heading to Twin Falls, Idaho to join a group of family physicians there. I hope to uh, share with you a, a case and a brief discussion of a patient that I was involved in uh, here recently at McKady Hospital with a, a fairly uncommon diagnosis that I hope you will find interesting. She's a 27-year-old female who her story begins that she was nine weeks postpartum following an uncomplicated pregnancy. She'd been experiencing a few days of uh, palpitations and diaphoresis for which she'd uh, scheduled an appointment with her primary care provider. Uh, but prior to that evaluation, uh, in fact, the morning of, uh, she was found apneic by her husband and uh, after a collapse. He activated EMS and began CPR. Um, EMS found her in ventricular fibrillation and uh, began full support and transport to a small rural hospital here in Utah. Um, she required several uh, DC cardioversions or shocks uh, in, during transport and intubation upon arrival. Some additional history includes uh, chronic low back pain with a history of uh, narcotic dependence for which she had uh, been treated for and was currently on methadone. Uh, she was married. She had uh, two additional children to the one that was recently born. And her diet since the birth of her child had consisted strictly of uh, Good and Plenty and Pepsi, for which she did three to four boxes of Good and Plenty a day, and that was her intake. Uh, her family history was not significant. Upon arriving at the hospital, her potassium was found to be 1.8, and she had a, a prolonged uh, QT interval on EKG. Uh, initially, she was given uh, potassium repletion, magnesium, uh, antiarrhythmic, and transferred to McKady Hospital to the intensive care unit. Uh, she continued with full support, a hypothermic protocol, 
and, uh, and continued uh, electrolyte repletion. The diagnosis she was given, sudden cardiac arrest, and the reason for that was uh, twofold. One, it was felt that she had an underlying long QT syndrome and that this was then pushed into her arrhythmia secondary to, one, the medication that she was on, the methadone, and, and the other reason being the hypokalemia that she developed. Brief discussion on the methadone. Um, there are many drugs that prolong uh, QT interval. I've listed some of the more common ones that are prescribed. Um, there's a list of three pages long of other ones that are known to, uh, to prolong a QT. What I want to focus on today is the reason for her hypokalemia and how she developed this. She, her cause was due to the licorice that she'd taken and um, eaten exclusively for that nine weeks. Black licorice, uh, the scientific name is Glyceriza glabra, contains a compound called uh, uh, glyceretinic acid, which comes in a concentration of about 0.2%. Uh, and it's been shown that as little as 100 milligrams of glyceretinic acid daily over several weeks can lead to adverse effects, the most common being hypertension and uh, hypokalemia. So to figure out how much 100 milligrams is, that's about 50 grams of licorice. So how much um, licorice did she eat? Well, one box of Good and Plenty uh, has, 100, has 170 grams of weight. Now, a candy like a licorice candy doesn't need uh, sugar sweetening because the licorice is sweet. In fact, it's 50 times sweeter than uh, the standard sugars that uh, we use for flavoring. And so uh, a, a licorice candy, if it's made from a black licorice source, contains a significant amount of, of glyceretinic acid. So how much did she have? Well, doing the math, uh, 170 grams uh, per box leads us to about 300 plus milligrams of glyceretinic acid. She was eating on average, according to her husband, three to four boxes a day, which puts her at at least 1,000 milligrams of glyceretinic acid, and she did that for nine weeks. So a quick review of the pathophysiology involved here. Um, how does the glyceretinic acid have this effect? It acts on uh, an enzyme, 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydros dehydrogenase, which affects cortisol being converted to cortisone. And uh, I developed a little picture here to demonstrate this. If you, the 11 B uh, hydrosteroid dehydroxinase converts the cortisol to cortisone, when you block this, which the glyceretinic acid does, you get a buildup of the cortisol, which competes with aldosterone at the mineral corticoid receptor, and this is in the kidney, in the tubule cell, and, and therefore has an effect on electrolyte uh, transportation, um, increasing sodium reuptake from the lumen and transferring that back into the interstitium in the kidney. So we get a buildup of sodium, and of course we have our sodium-potassium exchanger here, and so we waste uh, potassium when uh, when a person is in this uh, hypermineral corticoid uh, state. And so this is what she'd been gradually um, building up on uh, over these uh, several weeks. Other effects that, uh, that the licorice can cause. The sodium retention that I mentioned, uh, which uh, plays a role in the hypertension uh, that is seen uh, in these individuals. Uh, they can, there have been uh, reported cases of metabolic alkalosis as well as low plasma renin and all as a consequence of uh, chronic licorice ingestion. Now I was curious what the uh, manufacturer's take on the effect of the glyceretinic acid in their product was and uh, I uh, contacted the, the company and, and received a response uh, which included this and there's a couple items that I want to um, point out in their response. They do admit that in excessive amounts, the glyceryzic acid can cause undesirable side effects, including headache, sodium and water retention, loss of potassium, high blood pressure, and heart irregularities. They also state that uh, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has set a maximum limit of 3.1% in soft candy, and the amount of licorice extract uh, and glyceryzin in our products is proprietary information and will vary among our products. So I couldn't get an exact amount of, uh, of this product that was in 
good in plenty or any of their other products, but they do state that it's well below the FDA's maximum limits. So um, in conclusion, the good in this situation is that this patient actually recovered uh, quite well. Um, she had minimal um, anoxic uh, uh, brain injury effects. Uh, the bad is that, uh, that prolonged ingestion of an easily obtainable um, molecule or product can lead to uh, adverse effects. And, uh, and perhaps the plenty is that, uh, once again, we're told that too much of anything uh, potentially can cause harmful effects. So uh, uh, I hope you've found that interesting, and that concludes my discussion today. My name is Toby Davis. I am uh, graduating this year, and uh, we'll be heading up to Boise in uh, a few months. So if anybody's still looking to buy a house in this area, we have one for sale. Just kidding. <laughs> so uh, this topic is very personal to me, and uh, one of the main reasons I've spent kind of my last year really focusing on this. And uh, unfortunately, I can only give you the eight-minute version. So my purpose today is to uh, provide um, reinforcement for earlier recognition and proper referrals for autism, as well as improving the medical home for these kids. Um, just briefly, ASDs is a spectrum. Uh, it affects one in every 152 children, which came out in 2007. Males are four times more likely, and in Utah, happens to be the highest in the U.S., one in every 79 boys. Um, the cost of this is becoming overwhelming. A typical child will on, in their lifetime consume $3.5 million of resources. But this can be substantially reduced with uh, earlier treatment, specifically before age three. So I just want to show that uh, autism, you know, spectrum disorders, we may think they, they're pretty easily recognized. However, if we don't know what we're looking for, these kids don't really stand out in a crowd. And some can be so typically normal that uh, we don't even know what to look for. And so being able to recognize the red flags will help us point us in the right direction. Again, it is a spectrum, and you can get everything from very severe autistic kids to kids that uh, function in normal society. Um, briefly, there are impairments in three areas. The social domain, uh, which one is one of the earliest uh, recognizable uh, characteristics. Also in their communication and the stereotype behaviors, which I'll review. Um, this is our little guy at six months. We, sh we uh, had no indication that there was anything wrong at this time, even up to a year. However, uh, around 15 to 18 months, we started to notice a few things. Um, specifically, my wife brought up a few things, but it, one of the most concerning was he began to lose his speech. He no longer said yes, no. He no longer said mom, dad. And uh, that was very concerning to us, and so how uh, we began pr pursuing this. And these are some of the other characteristics that we came across after learning more about autism and those red flags. And this is him where we could always find him. He was an escape artist that would always end up near a car playing on some sort of wheel item. And to this day, four-wheelers are his favorite object. Um, some of the non-diagnostic criteria for autism that uh, basically made, made our lives very rough uh, the sleep aspect, he would wake up five to six times a night. And it wasn't your typical wake up for a bottle, wake up because he had a wet diaper. It was a high-pitched scream as if he was in pain of some sort. Or at times he would wake up just laughing for no apparent reason. And it was almost in like a trance-like state where he couldn't even wake him up. And he would be up for hours. And uh, during the intern year, it wasn't, uh, wasn't a fun time. Uh, we also noticed he was clumsy. You know, a lot of his friends of his same age were climbing ladders, climbing, you know, stairs, climbing up, you know, all sorts of things. But he, he would avoid those things and actually get very scared if he was up at a high elevation. Um, he was also very oversensitive, and he still has a lot of issues with this. And uh, trying to feed him uh, was, was definitely a struggle and continues to be. Um, kind of odd infections. We dealt with chronic diarrhea, you know, for basically the first couple years of his life. He had a lot of diaper rashes that were tough to treat. 
and uh, a lot of meltdowns. And uh, one example of this is trying to move him from his cars. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and so our struggle was trying to find answers. And this is uh, the main reason why I want to present this, is how important it is, you know, to be aware of where to find those answers. You know, we went to his office visits. We brought these concerns up, and a lot of these were dismissed as, you know, he's growing, he's going to grow out of this, he's, uh, you know, he's developing, he looks healthy, and uh, those were kind of put off. Um, but obviously, moms know best, and she knew something was wrong. And so... You know, my wife became a trooper and uh, tracked down all these referrals and uh, basically got, got us into the early intervention program um, on a self-referral. And uh, currently he's in a preschool through the school district. Uh, just to re quickly review the guidelines uh, that the AAP uh, published in 2007, is there needs to be ongoing surveillance. You need to be aware of the red flags, and I'll show those in a minute. There should be a specific screening tool administered at the 18 and 24 month uh, well child checks. Uh, regardless of any concerns, regardless of family history, that they should be screened for their social development. However, if there is any parental um, concerns that come up beforehand, you can also administer a screening tool. And one of the most commonly used is the MCHAT, and albeit it's not perfect, you know, it does provide a lot of false positives. Um, but where these kids need to be found earlier, you know, it is worth it, too, to use that screening tool. Um, and once, those, uh, once there is a positive screen, which can be identified on the screening tool, um, education materials need to be handed out so the parents can be aware of the process that lies ahead. Um, audiology should be sought out to uh, assure that they're proper hearing. And uh, early intervention can be started without a diagnosis. If there is any concern of development, they should be um, referred to that group, which they can pursue the speech therapy as well as a comprehensive diagnostic evaluation. And uh, the importance of follow-up. A lot of times when we were given the wait and see, there was no follow-up ever given. We were, you know, kind of lost in that. And so without proper follow-up, a lot of these kids can get lost in this, you know, in this mix. Um, these uh, red flags can be done in the office. Um, Social interaction, you can assess their eye gaze, you can look at them, try to get them to respond to their name. Um, one important thing is joint attention, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but you can also assess their communication. Do they have gestures? Will they wave to you? Will they communicate with you? And uh, finally, uh, you can assess through the parents some repetitive or restrictive behaviors that they have, if they have odd um, or purposeless um, movements with their arms, hands, or if, you know, the typical you may hear is they're lining up objects, but typical kids will do that as well. It's when they have the meltdowns, when things are placed out of order, or if you interrupt what they're doing. Um, this is a great website. You know, I'd recommend that all of you just take a look at this. It, it's a video glossary that puts two videos side by side of a typical developing kid with a kid with an autism spectrum disorder, and it's something that you can pull up in the office if there's a concern. And again, it'll help you identify and know what to look for when you look at joint attention. Um, one of my favorite things to do is just to take a toddler, it can be nine months, 12 months, and hold them in your arms and point to something. And as you look at something, that toddler will follow your eyes to that object. And they will look at that object and then look back at you to make that social interaction. And that's one of the first things that you can pick out in a social developing kid, which is very delayed if, uh, if absent at all in, in autism spectrum disorders. And finally, the medical home, which uh, we know needs a lot of work, but specifically for these kids. Um, I conducted a small survey with uh, the parents in these autism groups that we attend in uh, the northern region, and I was able to get some good responses. And a few of these questions I asked was, how well did the physician respond to your developmental concerns? And on average, it was a 2.1. And a lot of these parents had to seek out two, three, even four physicians before they felt their concerns were addressed. And a lot of the write-in responses, they would write down that they got a lot of wait and see or he'll grow out of it. And they often comment that they wish the physician was more aggressive. And how much of the referral process was done by the parent, um, five being all, and overwhelmingly 4.8, the parents felt that they had to pursue most of this. And how would they rate the physician's knowledge? A 1.5. 
And a lot of this, parents would write, my first physician was a zero, my second physician was a one, and finally we found somebody that, uh, that knew more. And a lot of these parents sought out alternative therapies after they had been uh, frustrated with their physicians. And uh, approximately uh, 70%, oops, sorry, wrong button. 70% of these parents had sought alternative therapies. And uh, just a brief note on the complementary alternative medicine, very popular among uh, autism for reasons of unknown causes, unknown treatments, not knowing you know, what to do, basically. And uh, you know, one-third of these kids have initiated some sort of complementary alternative medicine prior to even being diagnosed. And half of those that are diagnosed are currently involved and uh, there's not a lot of good trials. It's hard to do large study trials on kids, uh, especially with autistic kids. And there's obviously a lack of evidence. Uh, but parents are going to try it, and they want your, you know, your support or your direction, and they will ask for that. And a lot of those um, include, you may have heard of the gluten-free diet, the casein-free diet, other restrictive diets. Uh, very commonly, a lot of megadose vitamins are used, probiotics, omega-3 fatty acids. A lot of this evidence comes from use in adult populations or other you know, uh, psychiatric disorders, but very popular. And it's important for the physician to know which ones may be dangerous, which ones are going to consume the most finances. I have a patient that has spent probably over $50,000 in the last year trying to find some sort of cure for their daughter. And um, one good resource is the ASAT online. It's a non-biased non group that uh, compiles all the evidence regarding these treatments, including the behavioral treatments. And again, on my survey, I was just overwhelmed by the feedback that was given. A lot of these parents were writing two, three pages of comments along with just the circle the answer. And these parents want to tell their story. They want you to know what they've had to go through. And uh, these, uh, my survey was consistent with other results that have been published regarding the medical home for developmental disorders. Um, so basically my take home is the importance of surveillance, keeping an eye out for red flags, helping parents be aware of red flags. Parents may not bring up these issues, they may, may not know what to look for. And the importance of screening, specifically at the 18 and 24 month old visits. Uh, referrals, I'd like to re refer you to that uh, website, themedicalhomeportal.org. It's a great website produced by the U of U Pediatrics that has every resource available in Utah. And uh, all the information, education, handouts, anything you can think of is on that regarding autism. And finally, be, uh, be supportive. These uh, parents are scared. The parents are worried about the future of their kids. You know, they're not going to leave any stone unturned. And along the way, a lot of these parents suffer from depression. The siblings suffer, suffer from depression. And there's an extremely high divorce rate, almost 80%. And so being able to be involved and be supportive and not be a, another, you know, pessimistic you know, point of view. And finally, this is our little guy at age three. Notice the cars. And um, just want to leave this up for you, just the early intervention uh, phone numbers that you can uh, look up. And if there's any interest in a handout, I have one that uh, I could produce for you as well. Uh, thank you. I'm Kim Blewett. I um, am hopefully going to some place in north central Idaho. I have it narrowed down to Moscow and Lewiston, but haven't made a decision, so I'm cutting it pretty close. But today I'm talking about narcotics and the management of chronic non malignant pain. I chose this topic because it has been quite a challenge during my residency. Um, I have been very inconsistent in the way that I've approached patients, and this has led to a lot of patient dissatisfaction as well as personal frustration. But over the course of three years, I've developed some strategies um, that are used by other uh, practitioners that have really helped me feel a little bit comfortable with this condition. So today my objectives are to review some statistics concerning narcotic use in the United States, to discuss some of the physiological consequences of nar uh, chronic narcotic use, to share some strategies that have been used to maximize patient benefit while minimizing potential for abuse, and to discuss the importance of a medical community and its support. So here's a few statistics. So the United States comprises about 4% of the world's population, but uses 80% of the world's opioids. 
From 1993 to 1999, there was a 100% increase in hydrocodone-associated emergency room visits. From 1997 to 2002, there was a greater than 400% increase in the retail sale of oxycodone and methadone. In 2003, 10% of the population admitted to using narcotics for non-therapeutic purposes, and it's thought that up to 30% of prescription narcotics are diverted for illegal use. And this may be as simple as giving it to friends and family thinking that you may help or it may be selling it on the street. So we're all aware of some of the physiological consequences of long-term narcotics, including constipation, sedation, um, addiction, and overdose. But there's also been evidence that it um, can cause hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism in both men and women, can cause impaired immunity, and cause worsening of, of obstructive sleep apnea. And the mechanism behind the worsening of the sleep apnea um, is basically this. So patients with this condition tend to have prolonged hypoxia and apneic episodes during non-REM sleep. And narcotics increase the duration of this cycle of the phase, or the, this phase of the sleep cycle. So the recommendation has been to practice in the middle of the road by employing appropriate use of opioids in context of good medical practice, as well as appropriate attention to risk assessment and management of opioid abuse. I think we all agree that this is the goal. However, implementation of this philosophy can be difficult for multiple reasons. The number one reason for me is limited time to really educate patients and discuss the potential risks and benefits of chronic narcotic use. We also do have pressure from the medical community um, there is a push to refer to narcotics as opioids because of the negative connotation of the former. And there's also a big push to treat pain as the fifth vital sign. And within a hospital setting, this, is lead, this has led to over-medication rather than under-medication. So a couple of strategies that I've used to maximize, maximize patient benefit while minimizing abuse potential is number one, foremost, is to establish a physician-patient relationship you probably should not give narcotics to patients on a first-time basis. There's also some tools that you can use to screen for the risk for potential abuse. And then it's important to understand the different types of patients. 55% are categorized as uncomplicated. And then 25% are considered chemical copers. These are patients that use their medication indiscriminately. They tend to have a comorbid psychological condition. In fact, up to 60% of patients with major or with uh, chronic pain issues have major depression, and up to one third have adjustment disorder with anxiety. And the last ca category, which encompasses about 20% of patients, um, are patients who have a history of or actively have an abuse disorder. And it's estimated that there's about a 23 to 41 percent prevalence of life or a lifetime prevalence of substance abuse for chronic pain patients. It's important to make sure that you discuss the realistic expectations of pain management with patients. They have to understand that the approach may not completely alleviate their pain, but if it is effective, it should improve both their physical and social functioning. And a multidisciplinary approach is key. This includes weight loss, um, return to work, physical therapy, and counseling if appropriate. If a patient isn't willing to participate in this, the likelihood of a good outcome is pretty low. Um, one thing that I have implemented as a medical management agreement. And this is actually a really simple document, but in my um, document, usually I outline basically the risks and the benefits of chronic narcotic use. I have the patient designate me as a physician that will be the only person who prescribes the medications, and they also designate one pharmacy that will fill the prescription. It allows me to have open communication with all of their providers, and it also allows for random urine drug screens and doppel checks, and outlines the reasons for discontinuation, which may be ineffective treatment or aberrant behavior. And then another key is follow-up. I usually have my patients follow up um, every month for the first couple of months, and once they're stable, maybe um, every three months at a maximum. Um, during this follow-up, it's important to understand if they're complaining of increase in pain, this may not be a progression of their chronic illness. It may actually be hyperalgesia associated with the chronic narcotic use. And one well-studied um, case of this is narcotic bowel syndrome. Um, I want to talk a little bit, too, about community support. This is essential. The electronic medical record has really helped manage these patients. It's really important that your partners are willing to support your decisions with these patients. And a non-narcotic emergency room protocol has proven very beneficial. It's said that about 3 to 4% of patients 
account for 12 to 20 percent of emergency room visits, and a subgroup of these patients are chronic pain patients. And a strict emergency room non-narcotic policy has shown a decrease in the pain visits in the emergency room without a significant increase in outpatient clinic visits. So my con the conclusion, excuse me, is to know where you are and know where you are going. These patients do demand a lot of time, and it's much easier to say either I'm not going to give any narcotics or here you go, you know, follow up when you need to. But if you really want to help the patient, you do need to devote a lot of time to this. So I thank you for your time. Hello, my name is Justin White. I'll be joining the uh, Midtown Community Health Center uh, group in uh, August. I'm going to talk about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, today. I chose that topic just because I, it seems like I hear about it a lot. I didn't really ever know much about it, and it's associated with obesity and the metabolic syndrome and seems to be something that's only going to increase in prevalence um, as time goes on in the U.S. and as we, we become a little bit heavier. Um, just a little bit of background here. It is the most common cause of elevated liver enzymes in adults. And uh, this uh, NAFLD or NAFLD encompasses a spectrum of diseases ranging from simple steatosis to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. I'm not going to talk about that too much, but that is uh, um, uh, fatty liver with fibrosis and necrosis that is more likely to lead on to cirrhosis and liver failure. Um, and it, uh, this fatty liver is also the most common cause of cryptogenic cirrhosis. Uh, epidemiology, just uh, a little bit of uh, interesting facts here. Actually, 16 to 23 percent of adults in the U.S. have uh, fatty liver infiltration. And as your BMI increases, the prevalence increases quite dramatically. Someone with a BMI of over 39 has a 90 percent chance of having fatty liver. It's very closely associated with the metabolic syndrome, and the most common risk factors are listed up there, obesity, diabetes, and hypertriglyceridemia, things that we associate with metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular risk as well. Um, it is the most common cause of, of liver disease in the U.S. Males are more affected than females. It's mostly a disease of the middle ages, and uh, Hispanics are more likely than whites or blacks to have uh, this problem. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on pathogenesis because it's not really well understood. The most widely held theory is that it relates to insulin resistance, um, but there's a lot of discussion as to what causes this. And I'll just put a slide up there of, of a liver with the, some fatty infiltration there. Uh, differential diagnosis. So if you find someone with uh, elevated liver enzymes and fatty infiltration, uh, probably more likely to be alcoholic steatosis. Um, you've got to consider viral hepatitis and, and medication-induced uh, steatosis and hepatitis. Um, the clinical presentation is pretty benign. Usually it, we're checking liver enzymes because somebody is on a statin or other high-risk medication or just as a routine screening and find that the transaminases are elevated. Um, uh, generally, the AST to L ALT ratio is going to be less than one in contrast to uh, alcoholic hepatitis. Most patients don't have any symptoms. A few will have some vague right upper quadrant uh, symptoms, and uh, up to half may have hepatomegaly on palpation or ultrasound. Um, what's the prognosis? Why are we worried about this? Generally, just fatty liver itself is benign, doesn't progress in most people. There isn't actually a lot of good data out there as to what percent of people progress on to uh, more severe disease, but it's, it's low. Um, but it can progress to NASH and cirrhosis. Um, I don't have any numbers up there because I couldn't really find any good ones out there. Um, the main concern is if someone's going to um, progress onto NASH or if they have NASH, that's uh, a disease that's more likely to progress to cirrhosis and liver failure. Um, some risk factors that we know of for progression include diabetes, increasing weight, older age, and then an, an elevated AST to ALT ratio. Um, so the diagnosis, usually finding elevated liver transaminases, initiates an, an evaluation. Um, in order to di diagnose or to specify this as non-alcohol related, um, patients must consume less than 20 to 30 grams of alcohol. That's uh, one and a half to two standard drinks daily. 
viral hepatitis should be uh, excluded as well. And then an ultrasound or a CT scan will show the fatty infiltrate. Um, to really uh, definitively diagnose this, you need a liver biopsy. Um, and to be able to uh, differentiate someone who has just fatty liver infiltration from someone who has steatohepatitis, a biopsy is required as well. But we don't biopsy everybody, considering this is almost 20 percent of the population. That would be um, kind of ridiculous. But trying to figure out who is going to progress on, who's at risk, um, helps us think about who might need a uh, biopsy. Um, so generally, we consider it in patients with diabetes, uh, BMI over 39, AST to ALT ratio greater than 1, um, elevations of liver enzymes that persist despite life lifestyle changes. Those things would be someone in whom you uh, consider a biopsy to see if this is NASH. Um, just and it, there's no real hard and fast treatment guidelines out there. I just found this from Alaska Tribal Health. Um, what they do, and they said, you know, on their, their website, we don't, um, this isn't necessarily evidence-based. It makes the most sense to us, and so that's why we do it. But if somebody has NAFLD, they do a three-month trial of weight loss and diet. They repeat an ALT. If it's less than one and a half, if it's gone down, then they continue this diet and exercise. If it continues to be elevated, then they consider referral for a liver biopsy. Um, there isn't any outcome-based treatments. There are actually quite a few treatments out there that are, have been shown to decrease the liver transaminases and decrease the fatty infiltration, um, but nothing to show that doing that decreases the chance of NASH or cirrhosis in the future. Um, the most important of the treatments is lifestyle modifications. Big surprise. That's what we're all struggling to get patients to do anyway. Um, and uh, kind of interesting, weight loss is really the most important thing. Weight loss will bring down the fatty infiltration and the uh, LFTs. It shouldn't exceed one to two pounds per week. Um, high level of uh, weight loss can actually worsen inflammation in the liver. And then we need to treat cardiovascular risk factors, especially the dyslipidemia and patients with diabetes. Um, some medication treatments that have been found to be effective, treating insulin resistance with metformin or rosiglitazone. Both of those have been shown to improve transaminases and reduce fatty infiltration. Actually treating the hyper, uh, patients, whether they have hyperlipidemia or not, with statins, specifically atorvastatin and pravastatin, as well as gemfibrozole, th those have been shown as well to decrease um, the, a or the LFTs and the fatty infiltration. There's a nutritional supplement called uh, betaine that raises S adenosyl meth methionine levels, and that showed similar efficacy as well. Um, and then there, there's small trials with Orlistat, vitamin E, losartan, pentoxifilin, um, lots of different things out there. Um, most people are not treating this with medication. They're just monitoring it and treating it with lifestyle modification. Um, just, just an example, the up-to-date article, the author said we don't generally treat with medication. We know there are some gastroenterologists who are using metformin, um, but not very many out there. And uh, there's some of my sources, and that concludes my presentation. I probably left you with more questions than answers. kind of left myself that way as well, but that's because there's not a lot out there. Thanks. We'd like to, uh, I think we're running behind a little bit, and we'd like to just proceed on with our keynote uh, speaker at 11 o'clock. It was supposed to be at 11 o'clock, uh, Dr. Mario Capecchi. But I just want to congratulate those uh, uh, residents with their presentations. I thought they were excellent. And I, so I think uh, uh, the field of medicine is very lucky to have some very excellent uh, observant physicians joining uh, the ranks out there in family practice and, and uh, will certainly uh, promote uh, better care of, of their patients through their observations. Uh, you know, just John Shaw. Uh,